I've been using Hanley editions um, ever since I can remember. Already when I was growing up, um, I had editions of uh, Beethoven and Mozart sonatas um, by Hanley Verlag. Uh, and uh, I loved how the paper felt, what it looked like. Um, I loved reading through the commentary in the back and sort of uh, uh, knowing about all the intricate uh, details and differences between the different versions of the manuscript and the other sources. And it, it's, so it, it's been, so I've basically been a fan of Hinde for a very long time. So working on these editions, I, I really appreciate just the attention to the smallest detail. And uh, I'm very proud to be a part of it. It's really interesting when a composer provides their own fingerings. So in the case of the Sarazate editions that I uh, worked on for Hindle, the um, Introduction et Tarantelle, as well as the Carmen Fantasy, there are occasionally some fingerings by Sarazate. And I think that's, that's significant and it's important to include those in the text. But I'm not sure that Sarazate would have expected everyone to do the same fingering or something. I think sometimes they're meant to just to be helpful. There can occasionally be situations where fingering results in a specific um, sound change. Like for example, when it's, uh, when it's an indication, play on the G string. There can sometimes be musical, um, uh, like, like a real uh, musical purpose for fingering. And in those cases, I think it's, it's more important to keep the original fingering. Or if a specific, shift or slide is actually part of the expression that's intended by the composer. Sometimes that can, that can happen. So um, there were not so many fingerings by Sarazate actually. Um, they were just occasionally there and um, I basically kept them when they, when I felt like they were working for me, but in a couple of places um, I, I do slightly different. Sarazate was a great virtuoso of his time, and his pieces remain very difficult. I think they'll always be difficult for violinists. It's always going to be a challenge. But it's music also that violinists, uh, we, we grow up with this music. So, so some of these things that I think at the time were extremely, extremely difficult have become a bit more standard in technique. But there are certainly moments in the Carmen fantasy, I think especially um, the last two movements, um, that remain extremely difficult and are actually quite uh, quite unforgiving um, for violinists, and um, it's just not uh, yes, it's not ter terribly easy and remains challenging. That is where fingerings can come in sometimes uh, to help because um, sometimes a clever fingering can make uh, some of these very very difficult, challenging passages more playable. The way that harmonics are written down in music, usually by most composers, is they're always written down as fourth harmonics, meaning that, um, that the fourth harmonics that you, you, you take a fourth and make that a harmonic by where the lower note is pressed down and the upper note is not. Um, and I think it became the standard notation because it's very easy to read. And if they're always written this way, it's, you right away understand what the notes are supposed to be. And it's kind of, you know, and also it's not a big stretch. So everyone can play a fourth. So it, you, um, it's a fairly easy way to just get the message across. However, many violinists, in fact, actually play them differently because there, there are other harmonics. There are thirds, there are fifths, um, and sometimes natural harmonics that just happen to lie on the instruments. Um, and sometimes taking the natural harmonics on the way um, if they lie conveniently or playing fifths can result in harmonics that are clearer and uh, 
easier to play or louder or you know have certain advantages um since since i was trying to um write fingerings and bowings and markings for this carmen fantasy to to basically help the playability i thought it was interesting to sometimes ex include this as um as an osea as a um something to just uh, offer to people because it's it's sometimes the hardest thing is to have the idea in the first place to even just think of to, of trying it um uh that's harder than actually playing the fifth harmonics so in one of the places for example instead of playing the fourth harmonics which would then fall on the a string and um are not terribly brilliant sounding um even when you practice them a lot it's actually possible to alternate between a natural fourth harmonic and a natural fifth harmonic and then fifth and so this is something that i uh this is something that we included in this edition for example and there's a few other a few other places like this um and i think the goal is to just kind of uh get the idea out there Theoretically, basically all the harmonics in this in Karma Fantasy could be played as fifths, and they will sound slightly louder and slightly more brilliant. But it's uh, that's going to be probably the prefer not the preference of of everyone because that requires a hand that's big enough to uh, stretch those. But uh, in the places where I included it, I tried to pick the places where it would probably work for most people's hands, um, and I just um, I just think it's something that many violinists do use it but it's not totally mainstream just because you never you rarely see it really printed in in music and um it's a trick that we should make use of when it's when it sounds good The question came up in the Carmen Fantasy by Sarazate that um, there is a moment in the Habanera, which is usually by most violinists and in most performances played differently from Sarazate's original. Um, after the main theme, um, there is a major section. And Sarazate continues. continues uh, with this material, which is this ma material that in the opera, the, the orchestra keeps playing. Um, but in the opera, uh, Carmen starts singing. Um, l'amour, l'amour. Um, it's a very beautiful place, very memorable. Um, so not too long after the piece was written, violinists started to just playing that because the piano is also playing. Yum, bum, 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 bum. Um, so this material is already in the piano or in the orchestra if you played with orchestra. So violinists started playing this and it has been become really the most often played version of this piece. So then the question arises, it's not original and this is an Utex edition we are working on, but at the same time, it's such important information because um, it's the version everyone plays and in a way it is original because Carmen Fantasy is a transcription of melodies by Georges Bizet. So it is really part of the original material by Bizet. So it's not like it's just made up um, out of nowhere. Um, it really feels right to play it this way. And, and so ultimately we decided to include it as an Osea. Um, I think it's important that someone learning the piece knows about this version um, and can play it. But then there's also though the information, this is not actually by Sarazate. So just so you know that this is not by Sarazate, so you can also decide to play the other version. Um, and I think it's probably the best way to handle this. Um, and I think in typical Hinde fashion, I think it just gives as much information to the player as possible so that um, the player can make their own informed decision.
I'm very excited about the new edition of the Dvorak Violin Concerto um, that recently came out um, at Händler Verlag with my fingerings and bowings. This is a piece that I love very much that I've performed many times over the past few years. Uh, and it was already one of my favorites uh, growing up as a child. Um, I probably got the music when I was 10 or 11. Uh, and I remember the, uh, well, I, I got the Simrock edition. Um, what I remember is that sometimes uh, there were discrepancies between that and the score I had, which, and I couldn't get answers to that. So it's great that there's now an old text edition that answers those questions. Uh, the Dvorak Valin Concerto is a very special piece. Um, it's for, for a number of reasons. Um, it's not kind of thought of in the fir among the very top violin concertos. I think this started very early because Joachim didn't play it. And then um, it just sort of had a bit of a slower start. Many of the great virtuosos of the early 20th century did not have it in their repertoire. I think Nathan Milstein was one of the exceptions. He, he played it a lot, but many, many of the others, um, like Heifetz, for example, did not play it. Um, and one of the reasons is that um, the orchestration is a little bit, it's, it's a little bit tricky that um, it's not the easiest to have good balance with the orchestra. It has pretty big technical challenges as well that even though it lies well on the in the instrument, Dvorak was a string player. He he knew what he was doing, of course. But uh, it occasionally there are moments that are extremely difficult. I think more difficult than other nineteenth century com concertos. And so that's maybe hopefully where fingerings can be helpful, um, because there are um, just to try to get past some of those technical hurdles. In some passages, I provided two fingerings uh, for the same passage one that is a bit more conventional um, and will probably work for everyone, doesn't involve too much stretching. And then another fingering that's a bit more unusual, involves a bit more stretching, but it's cleaner sounding if you can do it. And when I was trying to decide between the two fingerings, I decided I really wanted to include them both because for different people, one or the other might work better. So the more normal fingering would be to play octaves, for example, with one four. <laughs> Uh, but then I, I provided also a fingering that is more like fingered octaves, but in a slightly unusual way. That's one four, one three, one four, and then one three, one four, one three, one three, one four. The, the, the goal of this fingering is that basically it's a bit, you crawl around kind of in second position with the thumb in second position and stretch up and down without constantly shifting so much. Um, and so it involves more stretching. It's a little bit harder to learn this fingering. However, uh, once you know it, because you're not shifting around, um, it will basically always work the same. Uh, it will always just be in tune because you're not, you're not jumping from one place to another. Whereas the more conventional fingerings with, uh, with the first and fourth finger, uh, they're easier to learn, they're kind of more intuitive, but there are so many small shifts that you have to do every time you play the passage. So both of them have advantages and disadvantages, and um, I just decided to include both of those fingerings. And personally, I do the one that involves the fingered octaves that is has more of the stretching and crawling around because I find it was, it's a lot of work to learn it in the first place, but then uh, when I perform it in concert, um, it tends to be very reliable and um, I don't have to worry about this passage so, mu so much um, uh, with all these like little shifts. With pieces that I've played for many years, um, I generally return to the same fingerings that, that I've basically worked out and um, I usually keep them, but they do change sometimes, um, even after something, even after playing for many years, something like the Dvorak Valen Concerto, I might still suddenly decide, actually this fingering, I'm going to change it because it's no longer working. And, and that's, um, that's a process that never quite stops. Sometimes fingerings that worked really well for a while uh, don't feel good anymore. Sometimes even change the process of changing the fingering itself um, can be a relief because you've 
if you've practiced the passage so many times a certain way, sometimes just playing it a different way can um, solve the situation. Uh, sometimes I prepare two versions um, when it comes to bowings, because um, I think the Dvorak is not a bad example. Um, oftentimes there are slurs that are very long um, and I want to keep to take so many notes on a slur, but uh, there is the consideration of the balance with the orchestra and what the hall is like. So sometimes uh, I do prepare several bowings and then see what does it sound like in there. And, and if it works, then I do more notes on one bow. But if I find I'm having a tough time getting my sound heard above the orchestra, then, uh, then I might actually use more bows and separate the slurs more. The bowings that I provided that in the edition are a bit of a middle ground. I do sometimes separate slurs just because, uh, yeah, when, when I think it really just won't work with orchestra otherwise, but I also don't want to separate all over the place and break up the musical flow too much, you know, and, and when you separate slurs, it's good that the slurs are there though. Um, and we put bowings above them, but you can see what the slurs were because when you separate them, it should, you should always try to make this make the bow change as smooth as possible so that musically it still sounds like it's um, connected. Well, I think when we first learn the violin and and when we're growing up, we get a lot of the bowings and fingerings from our teachers and then Later, though, we have to learn to basically work them out ourselves. This is a difficult switch, actually, for many students um, that there comes a point also when you're so advanced that nobody can really tell you a good fingering anymore that for you personally, you kind of have to find personal solutions that are ideal for your hands and for your own way of playing. So I encourage students pretty early on to start looking for their own fingerings. Uh, when I teach, I do often provide bowings and fingerings if I, th if, um, if I think they're helpful. And particularly sometimes they are, they are hard to find some solutions. So I think if I finally figured something out, you know, I, I, it feels good to pass that on because in some cases it took me a while to, to, to notice it. If you, if you actually experiment with fingerings a lot, it becomes not such a big deal to try another fingering um, or to try another bowing or just to experiment. It's something I do with some pieces when I learn a piece that I often just try the opposite bowing. It's surprising how often the, the opposite way actually works better or just as well. Um, and I think it's just, it can be just part of the practicing process. The only thing I caution my students is to maybe not, um, not change fingerings right before a concert or, you know, that, that's, um, that's something that's a bit dangerous. And I usually don't do that myself. I've occasionally changed the fingering before a concert if I felt the new fingering was so much better that uh, it must be changed right away because it's just such a, such a uh, improvement. But that's pretty rare. I usually, uh, if I find a new fingering and it's just before a concert, I write it down and say, okay, uh, I'll do this next time you know like before the next concert because i don't want to be on stage like sort of between it it takes a little moment when you change of fingering uh of relearning uh and in that small amount of time you're sort of uh playing you, you play the passage worse um than you did with the old fingering so i don't want that moment to be on stage mm -hmm.